wife hat and sneakers. Or oh, kids today. <laughs> well, come on, man, we're gonna be late. You can sing, right? No, sir. At least know the tunes I sent you? Yes, sir, I learned them. Hey, what you mean you learned them? You have played a second line before, right? Yes, sir, in Houston. Son, this ain't the grand opening to some galleria. This is a funeral. You have been to a second line before in New Orleans, right? Um, I lived there since the storm. Shh. Don't tell the band. Parade is for hire, boy. Aren't they all for hire? Yeah, they're all for hire, man. But now every wedding in Cap Birthday got a parade. Don't get me wrong, man. The parade is nice, but now everybody I know gigging, and I'm stuck with a youngster who ain't got a god clue. Cat birthday? Yeah, cat birthday. Come on, boy. <laughs> Just, just be cool, man. Hey, yo, well, fellas. This is John. He with us now. That's loud, Mo. Nice to meet you. No, Mo don't talk, man. Just speak to his home. That's happy. And that old fossil over there is young blood. No, thanks. I don't smoke marijuana. Marijuana? Man, I heard it called that since I got harassed by a cop yesterday. You a cop? No. That's real. You late. I knew that bitch clock was gonna be late, so actually, I'm really early. Who's that pie face mother? I told you, we needed another player. Where you from, boy? Uh, uh, New Orleans. New Orleans? What ward? The Loyola dorm, sir. Oh, man, a college boy? You see, your T didn't tell me all that now. Can he even blow? That's all we can get right now. You know, that's more than just about playing, right? Is that a red one? You must be getting these. Red, bro. Who is this? What the? Man. Clock don't get here soon. We're going to be late for boat gigs. His mama said he was so overdue, he was born with a goatee at his eighth grade graduation. God rest her soul. And he was late at her funeral, too. Showed up stinking a jack, almost dropped the coffin if it wasn't for Mount. Family ain't talked to him since, neither. He can't always be that late. So, <laughs> man, he was so late for his first wedding, just called the whole thing off. Preacher on the bride face like, you know you could do better. <laughs> My sister was still pissed, but that made her feel better. He left your sister at the altar? Yep, and happens too, and his cousin. And my other sister, too. And who do you think he moved in with? Always late with the damn rent, got us both kicked out. Got me kicked out twice, man. Made displaced our whole neighborhood, worse than the <laughs> storm. So why are y'all friends with him? We're not. We thicker than blood. But that ends today. What the? Clock had that effect on everybody he met. Late for his own funeral. Wait, clock's in there? Why oh, you think we need another trumpet player? Where are the mourners? We're the first and second line today. How the hell are we gonna carry him and play? Come on, man, carrying him one last time ain't gonna kill us. John, you get the front, I get the back. Come on, grab the side over here. Happy and mouth trade between solos. Well, come on, boy, let's go. What you waiting on? Grab the front. Rugged cross on one, fella. Come on.
right, all right, I'll say something. Clock. Maurice Carter Baptiste was an original. They say you live on what you leave behind. Clock left a stack of overdue notices, unpaid late fines, and pissed off sisters. Amen. But he was our brother and sound. I know we replaced you with John, but that's only in our band and not in here. I hope that John will carry on the tradition when it is our time to come home. The tradition that honors our kinfolk in this beautiful forsaken swamp. I am but a man and cannot judge where you end up, clock. But at the gates of heaven or darkness. They're probably wondering where the hell you're at, because you're probably late there too. We love you, Clock. We'll see you when we come home. If you're with us, go on, John. Go ahead, Neff. <clears throat> Soon this life will all be over, and my sinful days will end. Soon we'll take our heavenly journey, be at home again with friends. Just a little while to stay Freedom, the absolute freedom of, of being a fronterizo or a fronteriza person is to be able to go between countries. Even though I'm, I mean, like I'm a Mexican national, I've always had this freedom to occupy two different countries almost simultaneously. You are kind of living in two cultures at the same time. We're sharing water, we're sharing culture, we're sharing airwaves, we're sharing um, people. Hola, queridos Radio Escuchas, mi nombre es Gabriela Carballo. Hoy tenemos un episodio bien especial con algunos tracks de música fronteriza. You are listening to Border Beats and Babes on Martha Public Radio, broadcasting to the big band in West Texas. El Paso del Gigante. I grew up in Juarez. Went to high school in Juarez and graduated there. Went to university at UTEP in El Paso. But yeah, born, raised, and everything in between. 
there's these ideas of what Mexican and Latin American music is, and I want to show where it's at right now. So my show is Border Bits and Babes. I've been doing it for several years. It's on Marfa Public Radio in Marfa, Texas. It's about showcasing this kind of duality of the border, you know, like what is going on, not only in the border, but on both sides of it. Hello, everybody. This is Border Bits and Babes. Broadcasting from Marfa, Texas. would you call it, the minority of this area. My parents live in Presidio, but I now live in Okinaga, which is literally only five minutes away, uh, crossing the bridge. And I grew up in Presidio, went to school in Presidio, made friends in Presidio. <laughs> but I was one of three white kids that went to the school in Presidio. And I, I remember being a little girl and just thinking, you know, if I want to have friends where I'm living here, like I, I need to feel comfortable speaking Spanish. Like I just have to. Our family dynamic is very interesting because being a white person as a mariachi player, it's you have to gain the respect because if you don't, it's embarrassing. E, G, A. Obviously, when we play somewhere and they see that we're white, you know, it's kind of like, they just stare at us. Like, it doesn't matter who it is. Anybody, anybody's like, what? What is, what is going on? The moment we play, though, that all goes away. It's kind of like, look, we know it looks weird, but we got something to show you. Mi nombre es Gabriela Carballo. Esto es Border Beats and Babes. Es viernes, tu cuerpo lo sabe. Vamos a escuchar un poquito de cumbia. Pues a darle. Let's do this. So my husband works on the Mexican side of the border as an engineer, um, but that does not mean that he can cross to the United States. He initially applied for a tourist visa and that was denied. And once we got married, he applied for a resident visa and that is still in the process of being accepted. Well, my dad is the mayor of Presidio. I think a lot of people assume that the visa process is so easy to where the mayor of a town would have access to give him a ticket to be able to come over or something, you know, but no, that's definitely not the case. I can't like make a wish and him just, you know, pop over here. I, w I would love for him to be here, but it's not that easy. So we just got the new house. I have a house in Mexico. We have a house in Mexico. You can feel in that office and all this interview and stuff like that. You feel like a criminal, you know, like it's just they judge everything about you, you know, clothes, how you look. They make you feel like, uh, you know what, you're to me are criminal hasta que like, Yo decida si no lo eres, you know? It's like, you know, you see all these, you know, people crossing illegally. Why do you think they're crossing illegally? Because it's impossible to cross. It's impossible to do it legally. Realmente lo único que le, le pone, o te das cuenta que no es una mexicana más, es por su apariencia, pero realmente de que es la, la, la gringa más mexicana que conozco.
it's like every year I know my visa expires in September and every year is like a, I hope I get it because if not it's my whole livelihood would change like what I've known to be true than what the spaces that I've occupied for 30 years it's gonna change The best evidence that we have for the oldest occupations in the in the region somewhere in the neighborhood of about 11,700 years ago. When times are hard on the south, you go to the north and and vice versa. And it's that collaboration and cooperation that allowed people to live in this incredibly difficult environment and, and not only live here but thrive. You know, most people think of that border as being a hard-fought boundary that defines the southern U.S., and it, it really has never been. Even though it's been marked on maps for a century, that border didn't exist really until 9-11. It was a fluid border up until the 21st century. If anything, it's more difficult now than uh, it, it ever was because the border is, is, is being closed and secured. Um, you know, it, it begs the question, secured for who? The Big Bend, it's an S shape. And that S shape is what makes the yin yang symbol. If you put it within a circle and you have this S, then you have the two histories, two lands, two peoples complementing each other, night and dark. Two dualities, but at the same time, they're one thing. It's the same land, you know, it's the same desert, it's the same river. If we don't kill each other here, we're going to create something really new. Hello everyone, my name is Gabriela Carvalho. Good night, this was Border Wits and Babes. Thanks for being here with me. able to renew the visa. At this point, I did file for an extension and that case is pending. They don't tell me why, you know, they, they won't tell me that. Uh, as much as I like my life and living in the US, I haven't been in my own culture for a while. This Sunday, I was gonna turn seven years living in Marfa. that I knew what my future was gonna look like a year ago in some way, maybe not exactly. So I'm five months pregnant. Our baby will, will be born hopefully in the United States and the fact that like, hey, my husband, you know, he may not be able to be there when the baby's born. Like that was something we had to talk about like at the very beginning. Like you're probably not gonna be able to be there when, when I give birth, you know. 
<laughs> we're going through the visa process, but more and more, I'm not, we're not 100% sure we want to live in the United States. Like we, we've been forming our lives here. And so it's, it's just kind of complicated because then if he's able to go over to the United States, then he has to like stay there for a certain period of time before he can cross back to Mexico. And he has a job here in Mexico that he has like a contract with. So it's kind of like, kind of a touchy subject. Like, do we just start all over again? You know what I'm saying? I don't really see us living in the United States. Si yo tuviera que cambiar algo aquí en esta área, Realmente sería un cambio de mentalidad, más que nada. Que cruzar un río es cruzar, o sea, algo muy extravagante. Debería ser tan normal ir de aquí para allá, de allá para acá. O sea, debería de ser eso lo normal, lo que realmente debe de ser. Sentirse como en el mundo normal. O sea, no porque estás en una frontera, sentir que estás muy diferente. Each mural site has its own characteristics. When I first visit a site, you get to assess everything, the lighting, the space, the quality of the wall. There's this communication that happens between yourself and the space. You feel a lot of anxiety at times because uh, there's this little voice inside of you that, that questions whether you can do it. Even after all of these years, you kind of turn into um, a beginner. Well, for this piece at Dua, I felt a lot of pressure, actually, because in Washington, D.C., we haven't had a lot of major Indonesian-owned businesses for a really long time. And I derive a lot of inspiration from my Javanese heritage. How do we express that culture and American culture in a very authentic way. My name is Sita Sadali, and my graffiti name from many years ago is Shelov. To me, the artwork belongs in the street because it's energetic and it's just as involved in the conversation that everyone's having with fashion, culture, music, identity, politics. These messages belong in the street. It's important to balance that out with some questions about humanity, about yourself, about where you're going, about how you're feeling. And I think public art really helps to echo these sort of questions and experiences and just provides a great place to play. I was raised in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. in Hyattsville, Maryland, and spent most of my younger years in D.C. Um, hanging out. I'm half Indonesian and half Western European with a few splashes of um, Polynesia, India, and some Creek Indian. We 
we were raised with our mom, and she's Javanese from Indonesia, specifically from Java, and it's a very spiritual, mystical place. She had this thirst for knowledge and for travel. She was very excited about the world, and she wanted to find a way to study abroad. So in 1964, she came to Hawaii for an orientation for the Fulbright scholarship that she received. She was actually incredibly creative, incredibly spirited, great with rhythm and music. She played for the Gamelan troupe with the Indonesian embassy. She was a poet, a writer, just an all-around sort of Renaissance woman. But she also was working constantly to support the family as a single mom. I was the, you know, youngest of four kids, so you grow up a lot quicker. I started becoming really curious about, you know, the, the punks that we would see in Georgetown and, you know, the store Commander Salamander and Smash and other stores. They would sell vinyl, uh, there would be music, there would be flyers for shows and, you know, just getting into that culture and understanding that there's this whole universe. Growing up as this sort of ethnically ambiguous other person, I think folks like that find a lot of comfort in belonging and finding a tribe and finding a crew. A promise. <laughs> that was a gateway. and I started to get deeper into reggae music and then further into dance hall. From there, morphed into underground electronic dance music in all of its forms. So I was DJing at places like State of the Union, you know, on U Street with those clubs and Kaffa House and the culture of underground hip hop music in DC. Very, very strong. So going through those threads and sort of evolving with the city and evolving with these cultures and with the years, that still influences my artwork greatly. I remember the first time I saw, you know, a piece, a graffiti piece or a mural. I was so excited because it was artwork that someone painted large scale on a building and the, the sheer size of it was extremely exciting to me. I just, I, I couldn't get it out of my mind. I found other people that were doing graffiti in the area and started hanging out with them. We would have these gatherings where everyone, you know, sketching together in black books. And then from there we would go and paint. So it would be anywhere. Anywhere you could find, you would paint. One of those places was the red line on the DC subway system. I think the reason why that line was so popular is because it has a lot of overground tracks and there aren't a lot of tunnels. Also going through a lot of industrial areas where there were warehouses and you know places where there weren't a lot of people. and the Hall of Fame, which is another tunnel system in, by L'Enfant Plaza in DC. If you wanted to learn about graffiti, you went there and you trained, you know, and you just kept at it until you got better. There weren't a lot of other women doing graffiti at that time. But, you know, honestly, growing up, it's been that situation a lot for me. 
the excitement about this art form was so great that it like it, it just it made you fearless. There was no thought about who's going to see this afterwards. It was very sort of private. I just wanted to use this spray can. I wanted to use this tool. That training that I had visually, I think it's still in my artwork, in the energy of a line. When you think about a tag, so much effort is placed on understanding these forms and the flow of these letters together. So I think that's something that's really important for me and my work. I can find those threads back to graffiti in every piece that I make. You know what would look good? That should be in the front. Okay. Yeah. It's on the top. Well, for this piece at Dua Coffee, which means two in Bahasa Indonesia, was actually opened by two colleagues of my mom, former colleagues of my mom's. I'm going to represent for Indonesia as much as I can. Us being separated from our culture and from our land, my mom, she still was able to fold that into her life in big ways. And it's really important for me to learn so much more about my culture. That's the path I'm on now. Maybe I should make these match the outline color so it's more beautiful. On December 11th in 2005, my mom was driving to the Voice of America, where she had worked for over 20 years. Just about five minutes away from the house, a drunk driver ran through a red light and T-boned her. It's definitely a life-shattering moment. Once you lose your last parent, it's like... There's no umbrella. There's nothing above me. It's just me now, you know? So this sort of um, nakedness that you feel, you feel so many different things. My mother is no longer here for me to lean on for a reflection of my culture. I can't ask her all the important questions about what things mean, what was her experience like. So a lot of this is me reaching out and searching for those roots that were severed through that loss. When she was still alive, she would tell stories of growing up in Java and having this really hard relationship with her mother. And, um, you know, she would steal mangoes and climb up this Cambodia tree, very popular tree in Indonesia. She would run up there and she would be eating the mangoes and like, dropping the peels down and her mother would find her and come down from there. But um, I would take scenes from these stories when we were growing up and um, and make her little paintings and things. I was always connected to her stories, her experience, um, and thinking about this place that we never saw. I went in 1995 and the rest of my siblings went when we took her ashes. There are things that you don't understand about your parent and why they do things, and everything just makes sense when you go back home. My family had rented this bus to go to like our ancestral homeland, and we were sitting in the back, and I was just looking out at all my family. I've never felt or seen that before. They look like my mom. They look like me in ways, you know? It was just this incredible sense of belonging. My mother's name was Sri Sadali Kunz, but her nickname is uh, Eni, E-N-N-Y. So this batik pattern that I put inside this piece is called the batik parang, and it symbolizes the gris or sword, um, also called the, the tongue of fire. The flowers in her headdress are the plumeria, or Cambodia, as they're called in Indonesia. They were a flower that my mother really enjoyed, and she spent a lot of time in Hawaii, and those flowers are very plentiful there. I think she really loved those because they reminded her of home. Even where she's buried in the family plot in Kudus, in Java, we've got those trees everywhere in the the graveyard and the the flowers are just falling all over the grave sites so it's it's pretty meaningful for us she loved them so much we got 
the flowers etched onto the plaque that goes onto the headstone, um, along with the quote, if you don't try, you'll never know. That was something that was meaningful for us, just in thinking about her coming from Java to America and just being so bold in her explorations in life. My mother and her four children, she would always say, together we make one fist. We're very unified and strong that way. And the petals for the flower, um, they're five, so it's also meaningful in that way. I always put her name in the piece, so here I have her in the headdress, in the tassel. I hope that when people see my artwork, they connect with the power of strong, resilient women. And I hope they connect with the power of the indigenous. Those are two really important aspects of my work that I really try to highlight and celebrate. Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, home of monuments, museums, Congress, president, politicians, lobbyists, and everything else you see from the outside looking in. But historically, if you stopped and took a moment to look at any native Washingtonian's feet, you might catch something you wouldn't have seen anywhere else in the world. But why D.C.? And why New Balance? It started on a block. It started on a block where everybody, you hang out on the block, you hang out with your, with your homies, and a lot of the other shoes wasn't comfortable. Your, your, your feet start hurting after a while, so a pair of New Balance, you was good, so you could wear a pair of New Balance all day. But after a while, it became just straight fashion because they was expensive and they was pretty. So we didn't wear it just for comfort anymore, it became fashion. So that, that picture was at the Black Hole Celebrity Hall going to see Rare Essence. We used to go see them every Friday and Saturday. That was the spot to be back in 87, 88, 89. As, as, as DC people, um, a lot of other cities, they mostly took their styles, I think, from basketball players probably, and jerseys from football players, but we took our style from tennis players, so we wore a lot of um, Deodoras, we were a lot of uh, assets. Guys in D.C., we had five and six pairs in our closet. We didn't have one pair that we wore for 10 years. We had five or six, seven pairs. Some people, I knew some people that only wore strictly but nothing but New Balance. We mostly got it at, at Prince and Princesses or a few of the other stores down here in Georgetown. Welcome back to the Black House, baby. Welcome back to the Black House, man. My name is Parviz Mizrahi, and uh, I'm the owner of the 14 Prince and Princess. I was working down the street in the closing stores, and one night I had ice cream, and I was walking on Wisconsin Avenue. I count the stores. It was, I believe, it was 13 or 14 closing stores, and it was only one shoe store. That's why. I said, you know, one shoe store is not enough. New Balance, I started in 1983. It was hot. It started with the 995, 996, 998, 1400, 1600, and it comes in the 990s. And it's all the time was, the gray was the number one color. Growing up, New Balance was the thing. I don't really understand like why, but I with them though. I ain't gonna lie. 
out, so I ain't never really questioned. No. Listen, New Balance owes this shit out of DC. If it weren't for DC, nobody wouldn't be rocking no New Balance. I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah, New Balance is like the hottest going up. Like, I, I don't think it's going to never go nowhere in the city, for real, for real. Like, it might take us little breaks, like, you know what I'm saying? People get on other shit, but I always come back around. You know, those everyday shoes, so I, it's like all in one. You can wear them anywhere, outside, to the club, school. And you might see hooping in them joints, you know what I'm saying? Like uh, Working with New Balance was probably one of the, you know, best experiences I've ever had. Um, shout out to New Balance, shout out to Shoe City. Uh, Shoe City put me in touch with New Balance, and, you know, New Balance flew me up uh, to Maine, to where their main, you know, factory is, where they manufacture all the shoes. And that's also where they made my shoes at. So I was able to be hands-on and see like the whole process of the shoes being made. Um, and then the fact that just, you know, being from DC, uh, being able to show the kids in my neighborhood or the kids all around that, you know, it's possible. You can work with your favorite brands or you can work with some of the brands you never thought you, you might have worked with. Some of the biggest brands in your city. So um, the most important part for me was just letting the kids know that it was possible and that we could, like, you could really do it. I only wear mine on special occasion. I might have them on for probably like an hour, two hours. But um, when I see other people with them, like a bunch of the kids on my football team, they all have them, you know what I'm saying? They crush them, so they like play shoes now. So that's like the most I get to see them is when my kids wear them or whatever like that, my kids on my football team. But when I see people out in public, it's usually the same thing. They, they trying to keep theirs fresh. It's like a special occasion or something like that. You know, I feel like we turned in that corner because 80s, 90s, early 2000s, DC didn't get a lot of credit for how we was dressing and what we was putting on. Now it's changing, you know what I'm saying? People looking at us, so I love to see it. I love to see it, you know, expanding. Being the only person that was actually from DC in the office, there were always like questions like, hey, what do you think of this? Do you think this will work? That type of thing. And I liked it. I liked being able to put on for the city in that way and have that firsthand, you know, experience, let other people be able to see what New Balance represented to me. I don't even think I realized that it wasn't like a national thing until like I got beyond DC, you know, because we all grew up wearing New Balances. That was just something everybody had a pair. If it wasn't 990s, it was 574s. Everybody had pairs on. So it wasn't until like I really got out to Ohio for college and I was wearing New Balances and I had kids come to me like, what, what are you wearing? <laughs> what is on your feet? And I'd be like, you, don't, don't talk to me. You clearly don't know nothing about sneaker culture and what this means to me in my city. The fact that you think this is the dad shoe, you know, and as the, the rest of the country sees it as, like it means something to us. And uh, I don't know, I'm glad to finally see the people are embracing it the way we always have. It's definitely a place that they look to to figure out like what is like the pulse on the street. Um, because there are more people wearing it compared to the rest of the country. But I wouldn't say like it's like a super driving factor, you know? Like they know that we're always gonna have DC. They're always gonna have people buying in DC. So they make sure that like, you know, we're well fed, but they're not gonna like do something crazy because they wanna focus on other places to be able to get them popping off the same way DC is. I think it's 2008. Um, we were at the BT Hip Hop Awards on the red carpet, and um, you know we just at that time, um, you know I think they kind of identified what it was, and majority of the out of town people they really know like New Balance is, is you know um, significant for DC. You know when, when people see you with New Balance on, they know where you're from. Growing up, you know I'm I'm an '80s baby, so uh, you know in my early you know I would say preteen to teenage years, nine nine sixes was hot. So that's my favorite model. That's my first pair, actually. And um, today, I will say the 2000s. 2000s is still my favorite model. I really like the 327. I think it's a really dope, you know, homage to the past, but then it looks very modern for today. Um, I love the top-down view of it, so I think that's really dope. Uh, the 550, I think it's really cool to bring back from the 80s. Um, with just the retro sort of vintage feel that we're in right now with like, Everything being like a cream bone color and, you know, bringing back these styles and the flair that was from the 80s. I think it's really cool to see the 550s and the 480s come out. Uh, my favorite model growing up was the 2000s and um, the, the leather 2000s, whether it was the black ones or the dark gray ones. My favorite model right now is the 99. It's the 992. 990 V4 gray. 990 V5s. Gray or black. 
but really great though. Yeah. I know the DC Jacks would be for the best. Come on, Rock. Man, What's your favorite though, growing up? I don't really know. I don't know. He playing I like, around. I like this model right here, like the 725. And I like the 2002, but I like the 2002 protection pack because, you know what I'm saying, the, how it's made, like it's peeling. In my age right now, it's a 990 because of the technology they have in these shoes and the arch support and the heel cap. The heel cap is more important than anything. My favorite first model was a 996, but then I fell in love with the 1300s for the comfort and the color. So to this day, 1300s are still my favorite. And 1300s came with a, a sole we call an end cap. And back in the days, you couldn't clean the end cap. No matter what you did, once it get dirty, you just couldn't use, we used to use erasers, toothbrush, it still wouldn't clean. So if it got dirty, we just went and got a new pit. Sometimes people catch on late and, and every city take something from each other to a certain extent. It might be a hairstyle, it might be slang, it might be style of dress, it might be a sneaker, so it's cool. I mean, everybody's welcome. But just give us our props.